All right, hi everyone, let's try to get started. So we're on time for lunch. Um, so it's a pleasure to have Monica from Caltech, who's gonna tell us about bulk reconstruction with non-perturbative gravity. Thank you so much for inviting me um, and uh, organizing this beautiful workshop. Um, there were several people who asked me if I would talk about a new paper with Hiroshi and Jeha. That's not what I'm gonna talk about as a title suggest. I thought this would be better fitting for a, the uh, workshop that has reconstructing gravity and uh, quantum information. Um, and today it'll be uh, talking about a lot of uh, bulk reconstruction and I'm gonna put that in uh, with the algebraic perspective to understand it. And um, the end goal will be, I'll be including a non-perturbative gravity through the uh, air and this uh, formalism to understand uh, whether we can still have it in the end to understand about uh, infinite dimensional setup of the holography. Um, so I wanna really start with the beautiful picture that I took on the left. This is from a local museum that I thought it captures holography really nicely. I can see a very complicated st structure that's been shined onto, it's a projection. So that's a projection map we're gonna utilize as a holography and gives a shadow, which is holding the time. So it has space time as a boundary theory, still intact, it's beautiful. So that's uh, uh, really the picture I'm going to keep in mind throughout the talk. Projection is really what I'm going to utilize as like throughout as a holographic map. Um, however, it's mathematically put together, that's still projection and that's exactly this. And um, the middle one is really portraying that I'm gonna take an algebraic approach to understand this holography. Um, and that, but I, what I mean by that is I'm going to utilize all these operators and I'll comprise them as a algebra that's going to give rise to understanding for these uh, local operators in the bulk and uh, not so local and um, boundary. And um, with this perspective, um, it's gonna have a natural structure arising that we learned from a variety of uh, papers before um, from the quantum error correction perspective. I'm really going to need this so that in the end, this is going to be the crucial reason why, how I could incorporate the uh, non-perturbative gravity errors. By that, uh, what I really mean and with less beautiful pictures would be uh, this all together. Um, as I more explicitly put together, I'm going to use local operator algebra of a given uh, quantum field theory. What it really means is that I'm going to be sticking to the uh, semi-classical limit for the bulk. Um, and uh, it will be really understanding at a, a given fixed time or so, but um, it's work in progress to more go beyond that paradigm. So um, as I was saying, I'm going to utilize algebraic perspective. I'm going to take uh, from holographic picture, that's what we're really trying to understand, but I'm going to take the essence coming from operators. So that from the bulk, we can have local bulk operators and what um, we know about this will give rise to non-local boundary operators. And um, more specifically, technically important to me throughout the talk would be that it's a boundary operator smeared over the entire spatial slice or a compact spatial subregion. And uh, I really emphasize a compact here, otherwise I can't work with this at all. Um, and uh, natural structure rising from there, as uh, it emphasizes, it starts from the same uh, local operator perspective. And it's very important to know that uh, in algebraic perspective, you're going to really need the uh, quantum error correction setup as a code subspace inside of the whole space. The reason is because if you're dealing with the entire Hilbert space, the full everything, um, then your von Neumann algebra is, first of all, not going to be always identical to all possible bounded operators giving rise from them, so that you're going to really access the subsystem of it in the uh, bulk. So that's the paradigm we can explicitly use from a nice quantum information theoretic context as code subspace, and it's a really... Um, the one that's going to dual map as a projection, as I was saying, the beautiful picture in the beginning, as the one that's mapping to the uh, boundary CFT, as a in between Hilbert space to Hilbert space map, is how I'm going to really take. Um, one of the uh, structure that I'm going to use, which is not limited to, but that's the beginning part, would be uh, how quantum extremal surface arises. And under that, you can have that defined as a code subspace coming rise to that. Um, um, that's corresponding as the boundary CFT. And, what, and that's the bulk reconstruction we're going to really have. So it's going to have a geometric picture arising just by taking an algebraic perspective. This is because von Neumann algebra will understand which reason you, region you took. 
as the uh, um, algebra you're taking under, thus the code subspace um, arising. And that's going to be the one directly giving rise as a technical term as a complete recovery. It's just that uh, this is referring to an exact system, so one over G Newton. So you can have an explicit reconstruction done there. Um, and this is the natural system you're going to put as a system for um, taking the perspective throughout the talk. And of course, as the title said, that's not going to be the one that I'm going to focus on necessarily, because you're going to throw a non perturbative gravity with just that will not be it. So you're going to add that on top of that to understand a more gravity focused system. And uh, this is a special uh, perspective that I'm going to really take. Uh, if you're lost at any time because of it, you should really ask me um, what I'm really doing with this algebraic perspective. Uh, but today I'm going to stick to the von Neumann algebra for everything. Um, von Neumann algebra is nothing more than a, a star algebra, meaning it has identity intact. Um, if you don't have identity, that's not a physically reliable system. Um, we have a Hermitian conjugation meaning it's quantum mechanical system that we can still work with for any field. Um, and on top of that, the double commutant map backs to itself. The commutant uh, to put really together is that it's comprising everything that's going to be commuting as an operator level so that you can have a different region attached as a uh, commutant and it ma maps back to itself. And so that's the particularly nice system we can work with with the uh, context of this, um, this quantum error correcting uh, things arising where I am implicitly using hog duality. It just means that you're gonna take the commutant nicely. Um, and uh, operator algebras or uh, von Neumann algebras are of course generically not finite dimensional. In fact, the focus of the talk will be entirely an infinite dimensional system. And you can argue that, well, we can regulate it, understand it nicely in the finite dimensional context and compute everything. And well, not everything, a lot of things, um, but it will be very nice to understand how it works in the infinite dimensional context. And a lot of things become more explicit and it's a very nicer system at some, in a given um, more abstract perspective to understand the field theory system overall. As we know, quantum field theory requires Gaussian fields, it's explicitly infinite dimensional. Um, and from there, uh, there are a variety of types that um, I think people heard about it from yesterday from Ben Stock. And there are a variety of different types you can take from the von Neumann algebra perspective. Um, everyone that you can use very easily was this finite dimensional perspective here, um, which N is just exactly the dimensionality. But there are many more infinite dimensional Hubble space uh, admitting type of von Neumann algebras. So what I really mean is that von Neumann algebra can never exist without an uh, underlying structure of a Hilbert space. So this is why I'm really focusing on the Hilbert space isometry as the uh, explicit holographic map that I'm going to utilize. Um, and uh, probably people heard yesterday type two, type three, so I'm not gonna go much in detail or define any, but uh, throughout the talk, it's going to not matter. I'm going to work with a generic any von Neumann algebra and uh, implicitly implying it in contains all infinite dimensional setting. Um, and the reason why it's very uh, nice in this perspective is that uh, I don't have to utilize a specific different conditions and change a different toolkit. It's going to work as overall as all holographic map. And that's the perspective I'm going to take throughout the talk. So in infinite dimensional um, holography setup, uh, it's going to be not so looking different from um, finite dimensional setup, other than the fact that it's now admitting infinite dimensional system. So, but setup might look very naive, but coming from that as an after effect is a little bit different. Um, so I'm taking from operators, that's how I started the whole intro. So let's put the operators then in the boundary so that we can have explicit uh, boundary in this region A and A complement. Then um, operator algebras are the ones that I'm going to explicitly take as a, a framework as I was emphasizing. So these will then give rise to a uh, form algebras individually, and they'll form von Neumann algebras for individual uh, surface that I took for the um, CFT. So individual, it'll be a uh, MA, and that's the commutant you looked at earlier with the operators as a set, as a commuting itself. And uh, you can now imagine why it's very nice as a von Neumann algebra to take the double commutant maps back to itself, because now it nicely now maps back to itself. So it goes to original von Neumann algebra. So there's no ambiguity on the uh, which geometric region that it is uh, defined under. Um, that's a very naive way of saying a lot of probably very precise theorems that I do not want to specify here, but that is very the 
essence of the uh, this binomial algebra is one why it is particularly useful to understand our systems and quantum field theory. And uh, as I was saying, I'm implicitly using Hogg-Jelly. I don't know anything how to do it anything without this. Um, so let's now uh, put the bulk region uh, from, um, this is an explicit uh, entangled witch and like a sense of HKL or a variety of many other things that you can use. Um, so I'm going to take directly the operator to operator map to be possible. So then these operators inside will also comprise a, a local um, algebra. So that will be given rise to another type of unknown algebra. And we can specify them explicitly as well. So that then these are defined with the Hilbert spaces of the bulk and the boundary individually. And the map between the two will be the one explicit giving rise as holographic isometric map. And through this isometric map that's defined with the uh, this H physics of the boundary and H code as a code subspace that's uh, what I started with an introduction. Um, then the isometry that I'm going to explicitly take is the one mapping between the two. If that looks like a, um, just kind of like a lot of unnecessary jargon, it's really just the, uh, in the very beginning picture, the projection. That's what I'm really taking. Um, and uh, there is a one crucial thing that I'm really using here is that a cyclic and separating state will map to the acyclic and separating state between the two different Hilbert spaces through this uh, isometry that I'm taking. You can try to relax that, but it's kind of not really relaxing it because in, in an essence, it's going back to this type of system. As a, as a requirement. And through here, then I'm defining a bulk reconstruction, not as an individual in other ways, but uh, naturally the one arising coming from here, because this specifies the explicit Hilbert spaces with the von Neumann algebras that can be tagged under, which admits which a uh, region and geometry that it can take. So that will be the one defining where the integral wedge can be really located, where the uh, minimal surface is then given by the intersection between the von Neumann algebra and its uh, uh, commutant. So that's like naturally rising as like a completely algebraic system. So this setup will be now uh, translated everything from geometry into algebra so that we can work with this system individually utilizing to uh, with this additional thing. That's like clearly this is the main assumption that I made to make this work, but it's not so surprising because without uh, having a, something like this is kind of like a vacuum that I'll explain very shortly on what this meaning is. Don't worry, I will explain what they are. But basically, there is a map between the vacuum to vacuum. I mean, you're not really going to not have that in any way. And I'm not ex assuming any uniqueness of whatsoever. You can have many different vacua. That's fine with me. Um, so I was using this word cyclic and separating state. And that's kind of an uh, important uh, mathematical framework that I'm going to take. Uh, it's basically meaning it's a vacuum. And that's because I'm taking a Riesz leader theorem to prepare the state. So if you notice everywhere, I was using everything as a, a algebraic perspective and suddenly some state appeared. Then your question should be, where is that state coming from? Like, why do you know this exists other than just assuming that, oh, you can have some va vacuum. Well, that's because a Riesz leader theorem is the one that's guaranteeing it. And in a way that for any quantum field theory system with uh, of any kind that you can have such a vacuum prepared for a uh, for uh, with respect to a von Neumann algebra for that system. So cyclic and separating can be uh, defined. The nicest way is that you can have an explicitly defined uh, von Neumann algebra as a map between the algebra to the Hilbert space. So say you cannot have an algebra without the Hilbert space. That would be misnomer. You don't know where even operators live. That's not, uh, it can be precisely done in any ways. So from here, then you can have a uh, injection. That means it's separating. And uh, this is almost surjection that uh, you're taking as the uh, closure for the image of this map as a Hilbert space. So putting them together really give rise to Riesz leader theorem. This is basically the essence where it comes down to that um, when you, for any uh, region it's bounded, so it's not the full entire thing. And by acting on the, uh, this particular vacuum as a cyclic and separating state, um, with operators located in that region, you can reproduce the, uh, the set of states that are dense in the full Hilbert space of the quantum field theory. And uh, this is why what we should leader theorem really we can take as coming thereof is that you always have this vacuum with respect to a given von Neumann algebra that can live in that system. And this is, this is where uh, reason why I could write this state and I don't have to prove its existence or anything because that's granted by that theorem. And while all I'm doing is that this isometry is mapping between the two.
And from there, uh, this is going to then naturally arise uh, how we can understand as a um, explicit bulk reconstruction as coming from here, then uh, we already uh, had explicit map to give rise to it. And this is effectively how you reconstruct the entire um, um, bulk as a inside the entanglement wedge as a code subspace. Um, but of course, this is done first in the uh, finite dimensional perspective as uh, by a lot of people here in this workshop. Um, and uh, the entangled wedge reconstruction can be understood from this way, but relative entropy is a little bit more tricky. So that one kind of was kind of giveaway from having Riesz leader theorem as a state, and you could kind of uh, make it work by having just one more assumption to look into it. But relative entropy is a little bit more work needed because first of all, um, our entropy requires usually in finite dimensional system, a, a density matrix. Well, we don't have density matrix, it's infinite dimensional system. So we will need to deal with that. And two, what is trace? Trace is only definable in a very peculiar settings that's not granted by a generic von Neumann algebras. Another way of saying that is, uh, like in Ben's talk, he was talking about how modular operators uh, factorize into two, those are never granted, um, especially in type three. And uh, here we are going to now utilize in the end uh, of this generalized entropy formula that naturally arises. And you would probably wonder, it has uh, area, so how are you gonna deal with that? Um, we will going to deal with that by through having the von Neumann algebra protocol because the intersection understands as this arising root tacky and surface. So uh, this uh, utilizing the relative entropy in Tomita Takisaki way will effectively deal with this understanding just depending on how you set up nicely as a system. And by that, oh, you're going to take Iraqi's formalism as relative entropy. Uh, you can kind of look at the form and see, well, rho log rho and rho log sigma, we all knew this from like high school times. And like, you no, know, now putting it effectively together, can you make it something looking similar, look like a direct generalization? Well, the first thing we all noticed from looking into the simple formula we learned in high school is that it's like a measure of distinguishability. And that's the best thing that we can have from between the states. And that's why relative entropy is great. Unlike the regular entropy, that's very difficult to be precisely defined with respect to nothing. Um, and coming from here, we have a state that we could use at least that I was putting um, right before slide that Riesz leader guarantees this. So we can always use this as a, a vacuum state that's prepared. And then next one is that, that you're utilizing this on a relative modular operator. So putting the operator together, then effectively that gives rise to uh, checking the whole um, generation of the states effectively. And this is going to give rise to the one that's matching to the original system for the finite dimensional system. And it's like just working as in generic uh, all von Neumann algebras. Um, and uh, putting them together, this is the way that we're going to form everything to uh, write the entanglement entropy as a relative entropy throughout the talk. Of course, I'm not gonna to refer to this every single time. I'm just gonna use this. And don't worry, I'm not gonna prove anything throughout the talk today. Um, so the exact uh, relation between the two that we looked into, which was uh, captured by this schematic diagram, um, you take a surface to deal with it as a formula explicitly like this is very difficult in interdimensional context as you're not using really the area. So um, without that perspective, you're gonna have this two directly as a relation. Um, and Ryu Takenagi is like a emerging as an intersection of the uh, von Neumann algebra and its commutant. And uh, the exact, relation between the two, which is true in the order one over G Newton. So it can have everything recoverable. Um, so the necessary and sufficient condition of this to work out was that um, um, we can have uh, uh, um, explicit the cyclic and separating state as a vacuum maps to the other one through this Hilbert space isometric map. As it turned out with this uh, type of formalism taken into account from Arki, it works directly and that is still the only assumption required that's, that's needed to make this work. Um, and coming from this perspective, then uh, this is, might be uh, one of the nicest system that uh, we can deal with very precisely in the mathematical sense to understand where it's coming down to. So perhaps we can add a gravitational error through the system um, where we can really work with. Uh, sorry, could you explain the, uh, if you go on the previous slide, could you explain the relative modular operator? Like the oh, okay, um, I'm just going to try to skip this part. <laughs> 
So this is actually the definition of the relative modular operator. That's called Tomita operator. You can kind of see that it's coming from like this and this, but you have a modular Hamiltonian, it's exponential to that as a formalism you can take. Um, and this is nothing more than you're just mapping from a, particularly the one that's original here to um, the dagger formalism. So it's really like the mapping between the two. And, and what, what is the limit there? Huh? What, what is the limit there? And what is what? The limit. The, oh, this is like you're taking the, uh, the um, operators as a Cauchy sequence and you're pushing it to the limit because this is like a mathematically more precisely defined the system. Otherwise you'll have to define additional um, factor of alpha and insert it over there. Whereas in this fashion, you don't have to deal with it. Okay. Because Thank you're you. taking a Cauchy sequence and take a completion to define from pre-Hilbert space to Hilbert space anyway. You're kind of effectively doing this already before putting into Hilbert space form. Okay. Yeah. Which is a subtlety I didn't mention. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, is your isometry already fixed uh, by your choice of algebra? Because it seems that uh, you're, uh, you're already choosing uh, your vacuum in the bulk and the boundary by your choice of algebra, and then the isometry uh, is just fixed. So, so isometry, as I was saying, it's only between the Hilbert space to Hilbert mm -hmm. space. Um, but normal algebras will give rise to a star homomorphism, if you want to put it correctly, um, which is guaranteed under this isometry to make it work. But no, on its own is, and is not the isometry. I'm, the isometry here is just really Hilbert space to Hilbert space map. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right, any more questions? All right, so uh, then moving to it, uh, I'm going to now use a more precise term as a complete recovery, which is the formalism I'm going to take. Um, by that, uh, we're going to put it into a quantum channels and uh, conditional expectation. I will explain these terminologies, um, but that's the way that we are going to really take it in the context of um, including infinite dimensional Hilbert space systems. And as I was saying, this is thus far exact, meaning it is true on the order of one over G Newton. So if you, want, if you want to really understand gravity, that's not good enough. That's not really a gravity. That's not having any gravity. So we need to have higher orders of G Newton to explicitly consider them. And the finite dimensional context, a lot of uh, great people worked on this to give rise to a notation of reconstruction wedge, which is not necessarily identical to entangled wedge. I'm gonna explain what that means shortly. It's always like either maximally entangled wedge or smaller. And we're gonna take that and then generalize it to the infinite dimensional system in this perspective to deal with it and uh, to approach this uh, with an explicit uh, similar, uh, this type of mechanism to work, but with the now non-perturbative gravity air shoved in together. That's because uh, without the exact theorem, well, first thing, the easiest thing to say is that we know exact theorem is not really what we have in any of the universe. Um, the redundancy to bulk to boundary encoding can only be consistent with the Riesz leader theorem on the boundary. So um, entangled wet reconstruction is approximate with an error that is non perturbed in G Newton. So we're gonna take this formalism and complete recovery. And we're gonna take as a gravitational, this non perturbed gravity as an error, meaning that's explicitly going to be the bounding uh, of the um, of the thing, so that it's reconstructing up to uh, this gravity uh, dissipation, and uh, for a state independent recovery, which is the formalism that we're taking thus far, which is why we had the entangled wedge to begin with, um, and we want this to be working in the proximal setting of this reconstruction wedge, which is um, maximally at the same as entangled wedge, but usually smaller. And that's because you're not just dealing with a pure state in the boundary. We are actually dealing with all pure and mixed states in the boundary. And now for here, you should then naturally ask that, uh, well, how do you then deal with a mixed state in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space setting? It's finite, sure, you just take the thermal field double, but that's not necessarily possible to do with an infinite dimensional system. And uh, this is what we're going to be uh, struggling with a little bit. And this is also another reason why you're gonna have a little bit more complicated setup in the end. Um, so with this, uh, you're going to uh, then hopefully, um, not only in the finite context, but infinite context can also give some holographic calculations to the page curve after this formalism to be set up. Um, so I'm utilizing some dictionary here or establishing some of the dictionary here. Ah, I knew this will happen.
you see, woman's blazer don't come with pockets. It's really not okay. <laughs> but now, now the mic is working. Um, so we already went over like the first half that how we incorporate everything as an algebraic formalism and uh, how the projections are, as I was giving as a, a nice museum picture that I took, um, it's going to be the projection that you're going to now interpret that as a conditional expectation. It's nothing more than really taking the, uh, um, partial degrees of freedom so that you can work with the uh, code subspace. It's exactly the same thing. Um, and uh, we went through the exact uh, reconstruction formula. So from here, oh, what is it? This is not going on again. Oh, okay, that works, that works. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, so coming from here, uh, we're going to now also deal further on to the relative entropy in the same context and show that these two are indeed equivalent uh, with up to this non perturbed gravity error, and we'll see the, how the bound changes between the two and uh, understand how we can deal with them. Good question. So we're going to take the similar setup originally, but now we're going to use with the uh, quantum channel terminology, which is nothing more than it's giving you the exact isometry onto. So it's a normal unital, completely positive map. And I'm taking them because I want to, in the end, give rise to a structure that works with a completely positive uh, norm that's going to utilize together in the end, which is actually very difficult to deal with in this context. Um, actually, so sorry, just to clarify, um, when you say non-perturbative gravity corrections, mm -hmm. you don't mean, I think, um, non-perturbative gravity corrections that you're going to compute for us no you just no. more mean like non-perturbative gravity errors that you're going to tolerate that's correct yeah okay yeah just, you're going to uh, give us so a balance on the same page yeah. yeah 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 as i was saying earlier maybe i should emphasize that a little more i'm going to see the bound and how it changes between the two and we'll link them and it'll be i'll show you one direction but it's really a if and only if statement um and in the exact setting of you're having now conditional expectation, which is projections, just give rise to exactly this as like a um, explicit mapping to give rise to these von Neumann algebras. And uh, coming from here, we need to now edit a little bit to give rise to reconstruction match now, which is always identical or smaller. So that it had, there's like a different wedge difference that we're dealing with. And this is uh, where the difference lies in. And the first difficulty we need to do is how are we going to deal with this mixed states? Now, even though H code, which was the original one that's infinite dimensional, we're gonna copy as a large finite system. And you can do that. And that's a lot more mathematical structure we won't have to deal with, but that is definitely possible to still do uh, through the GNS representation technique with uh, conformal net structures. But from here, it's just really an augmentation system. That is nothing more than giving rise to additional reference system that we'll have to deal with to uh, have this reconstruction wedge in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space context. And coming from here, it directly just copies onto uh, this reference system on top. Um, so that this correction can contain all the uh, higher order of G Newton by dealing with the reconstruction wedge. And uh, coming from here, we're going to now associate explicit entangled wedge phenomenal algebra giving coming from here individually and with the augmented system. So additional reference system altogether. And then we can construct the reconstruction wedge as explicit algebraically as this. And you can show that this is always contained within the uh, Right, something that can give rise to entangled wedge, which shows that it is always smaller as a region or identical at maximum. Um, so with this context, you would probably ask then, uh, what do we, why did we need this such a complicated setup to deal with? Why couldn't we not do any of this and map directly like earlier exact setup and just come up with a mapping between the reconstruction match to that. Now, the really main difference comes down to, first of all, don't know how to deal with the infinite dimensional Hilbert space so nicely. Um, it's because the completely bounded norm is really difficult to deal with with this context. And really one of the approach that was nice 
to go round about it, as operator norm is the twirled pets map, but that's not still good enough to give rise to a degravity error understanding with the uh, explicit non norm identity to, uh, build, to build in so that we can understand the distance well understood in this context. As um, despite being type 3 1, we do need to understand its physical implications and system to deal with. Um, so, what's the, the cost we are really paying is that we now have a reference system that I'm going to denote as R from now on that's dealing with this doubly copied large finite H code star. Um, and that's the format that's going, we're going to now work really difficultly with the system to give rise to something that can be now prepared to give rise to a completely bounded norm in the end. And this is, and then this is kind of requiring us to work with a different type of system. And the information disturbance, disturbance trade-off is no longer really possible to be done as taking supremum or uh, with this explicit norm is very difficult. So we're gonna take something similar but different that's called a privacy correctability duality, which I'll explain what it is. But this is like in the context of complementary recovery. So after all this of reference system altogether, we're going to really do con the complement part as a complementary recovery. So we're gonna chuck out that system and then have the recovery there so that in turn, you can have the other side through the privacy uh, correctability duality. And that's the overall logic I want to really emphasize before I jump into slightly more technical part of the talk. Now let's recall that this is what we did for this preparing this reference system that was calling from dealing with all this problem for infinite dimensional system. So conditional expectation was nothing more than, than uh, the um, projections, but now we're gonna have a projection onto the complement that I put as A prime. Do you notice it's different from A bar? That's to emphasize that it's not entangled much. Now it's a reconstruction match. Um, so this only exists if uh, this particular uh, map is, this part is a, a product of type one factors, but all the rest don't really have any restrictions on what we can have. Boundaries are all just generic and the rest are all generic as well. But uh, that's not really causing of an issue because you're defining a code subspace. So that's not really much of an issue about the bulk that we're dealing with. Now we're gonna take a normal state on this complicated augmented system that we're gonna deal with. Then you can define a state to be now with a complementary recovery. We're gonna deal a complement channel instead of the regular channel so that we can have a state defined on uh, that. So meaning you chucked out the uh, that side and then the remaining side of it is how we're gonna deal with on every kind. So coming from here now uh, from finite dimensional context, uh, a lot of people, some of who are here, um, have prepared a bulk to boundary with a generalized entropy compared together as this nice modified version of the JLMS formula. The JLMS on its own is not good enough to deal with, with this system. Um, to have uh, non perturbative gravity built in. And uh, by non perturbative gravity, I'm putting that as explicit at epsilon. That's uh, just some um, negative of, of uh, some positive constant divided by uh, G Newton. Um, so that what we're really going to understand is, is that epsilon going to change or how it really tracks down to between the um, reconstruction, wet reconstruction, and the, uh, the relative entropy conservation from this type of aspect. So between the two, uh, it looks very complicated. I understand, I, I feel sorry about this, but I still want to flash this system that uh, it looks really uh, taking this complementary with the augmentation taken in together to give rise to it. And then the PA prime was just the, uh, the projection now onto the complementary channel, but you have to still do the augmentation. So that it just makes it really dirty to deal with it, but it still works. So. Um, it's like decoding onto them and the individual tracking the entanglement wedge and then taking the intersections. And that's basically what it's really doing there as a complicated system. Okay. Now, if you look at here in particular, that's the entanglement wedge of the uh, boundary region of A bar here and the reference system together. So the system without A chucked out. Um, and then that's dealing with the bulk state that's prepared here. And I see also chucking that part out. So it's nothing more than just uh, that part out and doing with the complement part of the, that give rise to the entanglement wedge. And that's still okay to do so. I mean, that's a well-defined wedge. So that when you have a difference of the wedge, so by doing this, that even though uh, it's not an entanglement wedge, by having this part, the difference is well taken into account through this reference system. And uh, from here, then the bulk region, this now complement part, A prime, and the, uh, um, 
Complement of the reconstruction metric in um, all pure and mixed state will be taken into account for this. So that how matter, uh, um, no matter how this row was chosen individually, this entanglement wedge that we prepared here is always contained within this region in the reference system because everything was complement. So taking that out, it's still contained within. So what that really means is that uh, the original of the state and that will coincide in together. So thus this is zero. So first of all, that term is removed. Now we should look into the generalized entropy terms and that one is more easy that we used the same logic earlier that this is a area term and the ball correction. And these two are the exactly the two states we looked into, which did coincide is what I was emphasizing earlier in the entangled wedge of uh, this side with the reference state. So let's really see the reference system is really doing all the uh, protocol here. So they give rise to the same quantum extremal surface. So that means this just cancel away. So it's a zero. So we're just left with only one term. So despite being complicated in the end, that really paid off, that uh, really gave into one thing so that we don't have to do any magic, just apply Pinsker's inequality, a la Hayden and Pennington, and taking the thing exact, exactly inside just out. And that's the one that's gonna give rise to be bounded, but with the additional factor. Um, so now we prepared up till here, and we know this is true for all normal states row. So that's going to really, give rise to this particular formalism. And people who are very familiar with upper algebra were probably now realizing that, ah, you prepare now so nicely that you can just put it directly into completely bounded norm context. But before getting there, I want to show how privacy and correctability is going to be used so that we are gonna pick it up where we left off after uh, this uh, theorem that I'm going to utilize that's gonna take all the uh, difficult jobs after the fact, other than, all the mathematical uh, structure that I needed before. Um, so privacy is just meaning that um, none of the information it contains is really directly accessible by the, uh, from the domain of the quantum channel. So, and earlier we had the explicit quantum channel under this isometry Bs. Um, and with this perspective, this is exactly granted for the exact setting because we're de dealing with the, uh, this A is private with, with respect to the complement for the usual boundary to bulk map. Now we cannot really use that because it had a dissipation with epsilon. So thankfully for us, there's a thing called epsilon privacy, which is what we are going to really utilize. So from here, now we're taking as a reconstruction wedge instead of it, um, then you're allowing with the uh, epsilon the information to be uh, accessible instead of being completely private from the domain of the quantum channel. So that explicitly has this um, epsilon over there. So that that's the one that's identical to our epsilon is how we really how we are going to really take so that um, it can deal with the uh, approximate setting that we're going to be utilizing. And similarly, there's a completely the opposite context like quantum information disturbance trade-off. You're gonna have privacy now versus correctability. As the name suggests, it's exactly the opposite concept so that uh, it's completely correctable and sort of completely private. So in the exact setting, uh, we have the ex explicit existence of the star homomorphism between the two von Neumann algebras between the bulk and the, the boundary. And the entangled wedge was the one that's corresponding with this existence granted under this uh, holographic uh, isometric map. And that was identical to saying uh, there exists a recovery channel for those for that region. So from for us perspective, we'll probably need something that is not quite as that, which requires that now dissipation of epsilon. So there is also epsilon correctability that we can utilize here so that uh, it's dissipating with this much of the correctability. So it's not completely correctable, which is what we actually need as a system. And I'm gonna now use this very important theorem for us by Kran, Krebs, Levine, Todorov. And that's the one that's really replacing the, uh, the um, previous thing that was mapping between the original things to original thing uh, within the wedge to the boundary. But from the complementary recovery is how this is really taking as a system. So that when it's uh, epsilon private, it has additional factor to square root of epsilon correctable. And you can do the reverse, but with a different factor of eight. Um, and uh, these gentlemen, I actually talked to some of them explicitly about this, and uh, they came up with the system because they're dealing with not holography setup, but some other type of a quantum um, information-ish setup that uh, required the correctability to be in the complement setup, like our setup. And that was also because they were dealing with the internet dimensional hyperspace. 
And this is like a common problem that I have to deal with. And uh, th this is like basically the groundwork that kind of led to understanding more um, recovery in the context of internet dimensional over space. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, this is just presented as that, yeah. Put it, everything is commutant, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. But I'm giving as like a theorem, that's why. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, it's like with the complement. Yes, complementary recovery. It's entirely with the complements. Now, what we achieved thus far is this one, right? And then this looks like it's completely prepared so that we will achieve some sort of a completely bounded norm. And that's what we do. And that looks very precise and uh, simple. And uh, what this means is that now the bulk algebra MA is private for the quantum channel of the complement part. And then this is then um, giving rise to this to be at a private. So with the now privacy correctability duality, it gives us a correctability with additional factor. And this is what we get. So that we now have an approximate recovery and epsilon was the, uh, to remind you, was exponential to negative divided by G Newton. So this is just like all overall in the exponential factor. So to put it together, um, now putting them um, in this context together, what it really means is that uh, we can have this too, whereas I was showing mostly this direction, you can do that. At every step that we did is actually reversal. And you can see that this epsilon became this factor so that it has a peculiar one over four factor appearing, which kind of uh, reminiscent of something like uh, A over four G Newton, but I don't know where this is coming from. This must be hinting about some changes in the quantum extremal surfaces, but I don't really understand where that's coming from yet. Um, to uh, conclude, what we really did as uh, explicitly together, we started with the exact relation between the two. So this was true with the uh, one over G Newton. It had an uh, entanglement wedge reconstruction as a complete recovery. Um, we started with the projection map as nice picture portrayed already. And that was together uh, with identical to uh, giving rise to relative entropy conservation and sense of JLMS. Um, and then we, put it to now a non-perturbative gravity aired as a correction together. So that gave rise to uh, approximate recovery. And that's considered for uh, using now different contexts as uh, using complementary recovery to access between the two different wedges that we didn't really have direct access to. And we kind of avoided the whole system by dealing with additional reference system as a it's a uh, um, effectively thermophilic double, but infinite dimensional context. And this is how we uh, provided then a reconstruction wedge to be recoverable. And that was, uh, and then that was mapping with the quantum extremal surface formula with peculiar a factor of one over fourth on top. Um, and uh, through that, I was really using the uh, construction of privacy correctability correspondence. And that's the one that was really needed to give rise to a uh, complementary recovery that kind of replaces the uh, previous things that we were using as a direct map between the two. And through this is the uh, context we could deal with the complementary recovery. And I think this is particularly going to be nice to understand with a variety of physical systems. So that this really extra reference system was absolutely crucial. And that was how we first be able to prepare anything with the uh, completely bounded norm in the end, or dealing with anything to uh, purify the system. And on top, that's how I could even simplify the JLMS formula modified version into uh, something accessible form without having any additional conditions to apply pin skirts and equality. So this is doing a lot of work there as a, a formal setup that I did. And uh, this itself as an entangle which is very non-trivial. Um, which is kind of uh, changing our understanding how the bulk reconstruction can really look. And that might be the reason where the one over four factor is coming from. And in fact, uh, looking into this more in detail is uh, what I really want to do next to see uh, where the geometric picture of this as an algebraic 
picture can come and give rise to. Um, and this auxiliary system can be identified with a variety of things that we can do. For example, we can uh, identify that with the space of semi states of the Hawking radiation. And you can try to see how um, it does actually check uh, current beliefs, such as like uh, how black hole interior is not reconstructible or looking into some of the other settings with the radiations and try to see and prepare the states better because the state is kind of given through this algebraic formalism. Um, and also uh, you can take that as to be the space of semi classical states of the other boundary as it's effectively not so different from thermal field double other than I was taking infinite dimensional to large finite system. So you can do a similar system like that with additional of um, dealing with this additionally as an auxiliary system to give as a satisfy of those. Um, and you can now imagine with the additional this auxiliary system to work with a variety of other contexts. Um, such as things like an um, island context or variety of other things that you can deal with, or trying to prepare with a different type of um, boosted surfaces as like overall different type of Hilbert spaces to give with this additional reference system. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, yeah, so I have a question about, so. Uh, I forget what you called it, but this uh, script F E. Um, script. Yeah. In various formulas, it appears. <laughs> yeah, that quantum. This. Chain. Uh, yeah. Oh, so you mean projectors. Was, yeah, so it's important okay. to do this privacy correctable correctability to have that E, right? Yes, correct. And, and remind me where it maps between. This is probably what you needed. Yeah. Okay. So it's just acting on H code and it takes you to MA. And so that this auxiliary system that I took. Right. Is a set over but it, there. it's identically. Adequate. Yeah. So, so that, that thing, I mean, this is a conditional expectation, right? You take it yeah. It's be, a conditional expectation with the reference system, basically. With the reference. Yeah. Um, so, so that doesn't, that doesn't exist if that thing doesn't exist if the, well, maybe it does, but uh, maybe not in this con. If the if you're taking it from a map from the the bulk Hilbert space, all operators on the bulk Hilbert space, which is a type one algebra, mm -hmm. and then let's say we take the bulk algebra to be a type three algebra. I mean, you're taking bulk to bulk as type one and type three. Bulk. Yeah. No, bulk is a bulk is a product of type ones. You can have a type one. So, so boundary is type three uh, or anything. Wait, so, uh, so yeah, I mean, so you're not having a complete recovery. Yeah, yeah. So um, that has to be atomic, meaning it has to be a product. Yeah, of this type is what I wanted to get at. So there is some restriction on the bulk algebra. Um, bulk algebra has a restriction, yes. Yes. As this uh, PA prime to the complementary recovery. Yeah, that's the one, because without that, you cannot actually have an approximate type of recovery with this. Um, but that doesn't affect the rest as a system. Oh, the complement has to have this structure. Yeah, so the, the complement is the But then the doesn't the, yeah. the, sorry, the comment, so doesn't that mean the original algebra also has to have a similar structure? I mean, it can't be type three, for example. Well, it's yes and no, because you're taking as a code subspace. I mean, you're taking a, with additional auxiliary system on top. So then you're taking as like a, what type of Hilbert space that you're taking as a reconstruction wedge to give as like a, it's commutant. If you're keeping the original Hilbert space intact, sure, but now your Hilbert space has augmented up. So that's not necessarily true. So I, I thought in your paper, you said that the bulk algebra, I guess you're saying the commutant yeah, algebra, algebra has to be this atomic thing. So uh, bulk algebra uh, is like, product like that. Point, like yeah. This. So the boundary is you can take so it. So the generic. boundary is fine, but I just yeah. want to, you know, get at what the bulk algebra can be. Ah, so I think that what's really happening is that taking this reference system on top was kind of um, bring it differently. So whereas before it was accessing fully, now you're accessing like something like this, and then it can be uh, different from what you're having entirely so that it can be probably accessing a little bit lower as a system than before. Like in the 
Yeah, so basically when I'm taking this, this being finite was very important, that large finite, you can only take it, but um, only take it when that's uh, given with the uh, product of type one, basically, if you want to have this uh, conditional yeah, expectation. I guess all I'm system. saying is I think that constrains MA to be not type, definitely not type three. Yeah. M, M little a. So uh, M little, yeah, M little both a. algebras are not type three at the moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, I yeah. just wanted to clarify that. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm now I'm actually curious. So, uh, well, I guess I don't really know what, because there's dynamical gravity. I'm not totally sure what I expect about the bulk algebra. I, I guess we just heard a talk. It should be type two. I don't know. Would that? No, would that's type, a product of type one. That's not just even I'm, one type one. It's a product of type one. Yeah. And that's also, I don't. It's not necessarily simpler in either way. That's also you can take as an infinite product is also okay. And it can be an infinite product of. Could, do the type ones have? Can they be type one infinity? Yes. It's, I mean, it's a product of type one. That's you know. On but that still is less than. It. Isn't that still simpler than type two or something? Then? Not necessarily, because you're not taking a product of some. Like you can have a product feature. It's an infinite in the product or a finite product. It's infinite product is possible. Well, that I didn't go on to specify further. That's well, that, all I, I mean, needed. But it would be nice if you could argue here that this really needs, like, that it has to be type two for this to work, because then that would connect with these other things people are saying. Right. Uh, this came out before. No, I know, uh, I know. But I mean, <laughs> this is not an accusation. <laughs> I'm just trying to understand. Um, yeah, I, I, that would be actually nice. I agree on that. Because, uh, yeah, I, it's, I mean, it's, I hadn't appreciated before that this, there's this restriction that might be telling us something about the box. So that's right. That's yeah. right. Oh, great. <laughs> um, you didn't say much about reversing the arrow, but I had like a general question about uh -huh. it. Like, I, I just wanted to ask, like, there's a step where you use pin curves, right? So you you want to say that yes. the relative entropy being small tells you that the operator norm is small. So that's an arrow you can't really reverse. So what's the new ingredient? Um, so here is like, I prepared everything like that's put it in that particular context. Like, it's just, it's not a several different terms. It's just one term that I'm using. With the reference system all together so it's just a simply just that and you're writing that as a tomato takisaki theory to put it together with the uh the modular operator and then you can reverse it track it up i mean that's a bit more complicated yes that i agree it's not looking as nice as what i presented if i can try, I can try to rephrase what i think pratik is asking so just mm -hmm. in finite dimensions there's an inequality which says that um states that are close in trace distance have to be close in relative entropy but there's there's not That's an inequality other, that yeah, goes yeah. that goes the other way yeah so so you need to have some additional assumption yeah right, i to am deal actually with that, right? that's what you're getting at yeah yeah i yeah okay i didn't want to get to this but yeah. i we use conformal net structure of the uh of Neumann algebra that's coming for this modular operators and you can reverse track it somewhat in a way um that kind of looks very similar but Yes, it's not exactly uh, explicitly reversing it. Sure, that I agree with that. I just didn't want to go through that proof in physics conference. <laughs> I have also a question regarding that point. Mm -hmm. So I would have expected that if you want to go in this direction that uh, um, the question was um, asked about, then you would need something like the Pets recovery map because that's exactly I mean, what it does, it's, it somehow tells you if the relative entropy is small, then you can also recover so that the trace distance is small. So is this so, the place where this enters? So because it didn't comment on the connection to the okay, pet's okay, recovery. I'll talk a little more about it. So the reason why I mentioned it briefly earlier, but the reason why I didn't use pet's map or troll pet's map is because that's like directly using operator norm, not using a completely bounded norm. Whereas I wanted to actually prepare it to give rise to a completely bounded norm for one. And two, dealing with inequalities and just purely operator norm is a lot harder. And uh, dealing with the just different wedge differences, this is a lot easier to deal with without having um, easy way to deal with the completely bounded norm to deal with. Um, and this is kind of, this direction is a lot easier, of course, because 
you can have a pin skirt inequality and that looks very step-by-step -step nice way to demonstrate it. And yes, the other way around, you have to uh, prepare additional map that kind of looks similar to uh, um, PETS map, but slightly different in a way that it's using uh, more, it's a good way to say this. It's like slightly different in a way that it's uh, containing different support of its domain. And it's kind of effectively a similar thing, but it admits uh, different norm structure is also allowed. Like you can have the L2 norm and then uh, with the defined uh, Hilbert space that can admit that and then you convert it to a different norm as I get the map directly. And it's like similar to pattern, but not quite. Yeah. So somehow this correctability privacy duality must involve something like the pets map, right? That's right. Whatever That's, the it's very is. similar, but it doesn't yeah. explicitly use it. Yeah. Anyone else? All right, let's let's thank Monica also for making lunch for the work.